Georgia Dow from iMore is here to talk about Nintendo Switch, Apple MacBooks, and Microsoft AI. Plus, we go behind the scenes with Project Aura. That was Google's modular phone. All that and a whole lot more coming up on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1683, recorded Friday, January 13th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, work with one that has your best interest in mind. Use Rocket Mortgage for a transparent, trustworthy home loan process that's completely online. Go to quickenloans.com slash TNT. And by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you fresh, high-quality ingredients to cook delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twit. Hello and welcome to Tech News Today. This is a show where we tell you every single thing you need to know about technology that happened today. And we do it with people who are passionate about technology. I'm Megan Maroney. Jason Howell is on vacation but I am joined by the fabulous tech expert, gamer, psychotherapist, Georgia Dow from iMore. Welcome, Georgia. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it is good to have you. Thanks for coming on. And you filled in for me on iOS today when I was out a couple of weeks ago. I really appreciate it. Uh, tell us, uh, tell everyone who hasn't met you before uh, what you do at iMore and beyond. So I do a whole bunch of podcasts. I write about psychology and the psychology of technology and review the coolest tech. Um, I do some gaming podcasts. I love technology. And I'm also a psychotherapist in the daytime. So I deal with anxiety, depression, um, parenting issues, and a lot of fun stuff as well. Well, so let's uh, get right to the news. We'll start with the story that's captivated Nintendo fans since last night. The Switch, that's the name of the much-anticipated 6.2-inch multi-touch screen portable gaming system from Nintendo. The Verge says, with true portability combined with the ability to stream high-res to your television, that Nintendo already gets right what the Wii U gets wrong. The Switch gets right what the Wii U gets wrong. The Joy-Con, that's the controller, uh, That's and there's also an option for a Pro Controller. The whole system will cost you $300. It'll be available on March 3rd. Now, I know you have a lot of, uh, a, of video game systems and VR in your collection. Are you planning on adding the Switch? We're not sure. I was, I was leaning actually towards no before I uh, watched Nintendo's presentation. And then after I watched, I'm thinking, you know, maybe this would be good for my kids when they want to play, um, when they want to bring their tech with them. It's kind of cute, but it does carry a, a heavy price tag for what you're getting out of it. Mm -hmm. Now, do your kids, do, they, do you usually let them take iPads and things when they're, like, when you're traveling? Is that what you're talking about? They don't, they don't usually like, but we, we let them bring it on. But when they're on really long trips, we actually want them to be able to go on the trip without having technology with them. But we let them play every day if they've earned their points to be able to play video games. And so then they can play whatever video game they choose to. And it's really adorable. I like the idea of it. I don't know if I would like the application of Switch as much as I'd actually like it. Are you thinking about getting it yourself? No, uh, Nintendo is not really my thing. It was never really, it wasn't part of my childhood. I'm an Atari girl. That's where my nostalgia uh, for video games goes. Uh, so no, I don't think I would. And my, my kids are not, all, they're not, I mean, they haven't even asked to play Super Mario Run, even though we have it on the iPad. They're just right. not interested in it. So it's not something that I think I would get for me or my family. Like, you know, I, I'm sure that Zelda is a beautiful, wonderful game, but it's it's not something that I've ever really played. Is it part of your childhood, Nintendo? It is. I love Nintendo. My brother actually had an Atari. I had Nintendo, and it's a big part. I have every single Nintendo system sitting behind me. Um, and, yeah, I love it. Mario Kart's one of my favorite games. I love Zelda. love the Final Fantasy series. Um so it is, it's, it's, it would be something that I would be the target audience for. But I think that where it misses is that 
for portability, it doesn't have a really long battery life. And then as a console, it it still doesn't have the power in comparison to like an Xbox. And so you're kind of missing out on both worlds and it has a little bit of everything. And so I'm not really sure which niche it would fit in, in our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So the battery life when it's not docked is around three hours, right? Yeah, it's between two to six, depending on what game you're playing. And, you know, that's not a long time to be able to play and be portable. So if you're on a really long trip, you have to make sure that you're charging at the same time as you're playing, which you can do. And the the other issue that I have is that the both controllers on the sides are not e equidistant to each other. So they're, one of them is completely different layout, even if you flip it around than the other side. And so that, for me, would get me messed up when I was using it. Mm -hmm. And what so about, you, yeah, I see that. What about the parental controls? Is that something that you've taken a look at, something that seems useful as a parent? I think that it's, I think that that's great. Um, but, you know, my kids are already pretty good. I already have all of my computers and my iPads already set up with all of the parental controls on it. So it's not something that I worry about because mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the, the subscription system of you only get to play one game a month online is, you know, from the NES and one from the SNS. It doesn't seem to be enough to be able to warrant it. I think that they really need to look into more of the Netflix use as you want model if that's going to fly. And I, I hope that they're going to change that. Right. So yeah, the subscription service is free in the beginning, but then you'll, you'll have to pay for it eventually. So yeah, I guess, so those aren't games that you download. So if you, you can't just, you don't get to keep those games. Is it just something that you play online? Yeah, I think that, and then you, you, there's only a, there's only a certain number, a really strong restriction on the amount of number of games that you're going to be able to, to have during that period of time. So I'm, I'm not sure. So I don't know. I think that it, there's a lot of people that are really excited about this, and I, I think that it has some really cool modules. Did you see that when they were doing the uh, Switch 1, 2, where you're like, you know, doing a gun battle against other people, or you're boxing using arms? Those are really neat ideas, but again, we have VR, so then VR would still beat out Nintendo for that. Mm -hmm. Well, Consumer Reports says that they will now give Apple's new MacBooks their coveted recommended rating. Back in December, the magazine said they could not recommend the laptops due to inconsistent battery life. Apple fixed the bug on January 9th, and now Consumer Reports has retested the MacBooks, and they recommend them. The battery life in Consumer Reports testing was even higher than the 10 hours that Apple claims. The average battery life, according to testing, is 15.75 hours for the 13-inch with the touch bar, 18.75 hours for the 13 inch without the touch bar and 17.25 hours for the 15 inch with all, they all come with touch bars, whether you want a touch bar or not. Now, do you have any big thoughts about the new MacBooks? Do you have one? Are you planning on getting one? No, I, I have, I'm, I'm one of the people that are and probably the only person on IMR that's, that is not interested in the new MacBooks. For me, they're, they're underpowered for what the price is, and I'm not interested in the, the touch bar. I think it's more, um, I'll just say gimmicky than, than what the use would be. If it was a full touch screen, then I would be really excited and interested into it. But it's just not high enough powered, and I do not like dongles, so... You know, I'm I'm really happy about the, the battery life and Consumer Electronics is now uh, Consumer Reports is now um, you know recommending it, but for me it's it's still a no go. How about you, Megan? Uh, yeah, I don't I don't I'm not interested in it. I mean, I don't I don't feel like I need to replace this what I already have, and it does mm -hmm. seem like I mean a lot of the reviewers are just like eh, it's fine. Um, so it seems to me that because of that, because of the real, you know, that, that techies are just saying, I don't, I don't think I need it. It seems like they need the readers of Consumer Reports, the, the average people who are like, yeah, I, I guess, um, you know, I replace my iPhone every couple of years. I should probably replace my MacBook, too, for no other reason than they have some money burning in their pocket. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it doesn't, doesn't it have enough of an upgrade to, to be a noticeable difference for me at all with what I use. I usually actually use, I podcast on my old air and I do have a, a MacBook, but it's, you know, 
that's that's good enough for me. And I think that I'll stick with that until there's something really innovative that draws me in. Yeah, I mean, I, I do so few things that require the power of a laptop. Um, I'm not even really writing that much. So I, I feel like I would be more inclined to try to figure out a way to just use my iPad Pro all the time and not even get another MacBook. See, for me, the problem with why I can't use, uh, like, I don't, I don't use my iPads at all anymore. So for me, it's just, I need the keyboard, I need a trackpad, I want the power, I want the speed. Um, but I'm still, I'm just waiting for a touchscreen. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess it's good that they have uh, updated their reviews. Um, they, they were testing the they, they were testing the laptops. I think we reported this earlier this week. They were testing it in a way that the average person wouldn't necessarily use. They were testing it in developer mode. That's how they test all their laptops. So, um, but it was a bug that, that Apple has now fixed. Facebook-owned messaging tool WhatsApp is under the privacy microscope again, this time for what The Guardian is calling a backdoor that allows snooping, even on encrypted messages. Sources call the flaw a threat to privacy and a potential tool for government agency spying However, the, after this article came out, security experts have said that the Guardian report is flawed, that the flaw that they're talking about uh, in WhatsApp is really a loophole that users can close by choosing to be notified when anyone who communicates, uh, anyone they communicate with changes their encryption key. So I'm not going to pretend that I understand exactly all of what this means. But basically, I think the Guardian was a little hyperbolic, calling it a backdoor. Even the security researcher that they talked to said uh, that, they, that he didn't say uh, it was, he said it was a vulnerability, not a backdoor. And Facebook is calling it a design decision. Are you a big user of WhatsApp? No, I don't use WhatsApp actually exactly for that reason. Um, I'm not a great, like I really care about my privacy and so I don't use Facebook for that reason. And when Facebook got WhatsApp, I was like, you know what, I'm going to opt out and not um, go with them. And I think that though they they probably went way too far with saying that this was, you know, a backdoor into it versus a vulnerability versus a loophole, whatever it might be. I think that it's better for us to have people that are checking into it, making sure that things are, you know, really secure because a lot of people use WhatsApp because of the end-to-end -end encryption, because they want to know that everything is safe. And there's a lot of people that live in parts of the world where what they say could be used against them and they could end up being, you know, brought to prison or sanctioned or, you know, given fines because of that. And so it's really important that, you know, when you say that some, like, you know, I think that most people wouldn't even know if some, you know, you, you get a message that, you know, someone else is, you know, using without an encryption. I don't think that most people would even understand what that meant. Yeah, I mean, there's encryption on iMessage, right? And I, I think, you know, most average people use, many average people use iMessage and probably don't think about that. I guess what was going on here was important to someone who's a whistleblower or someone that really does value their privacy. What would happen is these, I think, I'm going to explain this. Uh, I'm going to try to explain it, that the encryption keys get changed, get exchanged in unison. So if someone was offline and you sent your encryption key with WhatsApp, then another one would be sent later when the person was back online. And theoretically, WhatsApp, Facebook could access this encryption key and, and see it uh, and then read your message. But that's not, you know, whereas WhatsApp and Facebook always say we can't even access it even if we wanted to. So basically they could, but you can close it yeah. off. And, and change it. So, yeah, I well, think you could know about it. I don't know if you can actually close it off and change it because when it's offline, they could reset. Like what they were saying was, was I think that the government could ask fa uh, Facebook to be able to, you know, resend encryption keys to both parties because that's one of the issues that they could do at any point in time if they were given, you know, a court order to do that, and people would not be aware of that. And so you might get a message later that that had happened. But, you know, I would then assume that they could probably ha have that happen without getting a message being sent. So it's something that I think we need to look into. Right. Yeah, you're right. It's you couldn't. Yeah, you can't stop it. You would just get notified if the person and you would say to the person, did you change your device? And, you know, they, they might say, yes, I did or no, I didn't. So you're right. Well, let's move on to a Canadian story just for you, Georgia. Microsoft acquired a Toronto-based AI startup called Maluba in a blog post on their site. The creators of Maluba say they're focused is artificial general intelligence or creating literate machines that can think. 
Microsoft's artificial intelligence head executive Harry Shum says Microsoft will share their plans for Maluba in the coming months, but it will most likely include some kind of AI for the enterprise. And I had never heard this term artificial general intelligence. I think what they're talking about is answering questions uh, and decision making, things that might make your job uh, better and faster. I know as a psychotherapist, um, did, did reading this, uh, I, I mean, how do you feel about AI from, from that perspective, come from the perspective of, of what they were talking about? Humans have this innate desire to understand, to know and understand, and we can create artificial intelligence that will want the same? Yeah, I think that I, it, it, I have two minds of that. So whenever I use Siri and Siri does not understand a simple question, I'm like, we really need to boost up AI so that, you know, just, you know, they can understand basic terms that people would use in conversation. And then from a psychotherapeutic point, I think that there are a lot of issues and problems that can come up when AI becomes more intelligent and understands. And yeah, we're definitely, you know, many years down the line until AI is going to become more sentient and more understanding and be able to make its own decision making uh, besides the rudimentary levels that it has now. But there's definitely some problems that come up with that. Not only I'm, I'm not talking about, you know, the robot apocalypse, which, you know, for sure is coming. I have my tin hat ready for that day. But um, more for the manner in which people interact with their computers and phones. And we're already so attached to our technology. Think about when it becomes more of an assistant where it can talk to you and comfort you and care for you. We have an innate attraction to things. I know that my one of my children gets like attached to like boxes that like his toys were thrown out in when his computers are actually talking to him. I can see people spending longer and longer interacting with computers that are so much easier than with people that become difficult. I, I believe I said it was a Toronto-based company, and I'm thinking that maybe it's a Montreal-based company. Those two I believe places. that it was both, Okay, actually. I think that they were in Waterloo, and then they moved to the uh, University of Montreal. So, Okay, good. You're right. That, right. I'm both. Cool. PC Guy 8088 was saying that it was Montreal. He thought it was Montreal. So, yes, both. Different places. Thank goodness we had you, a Canadian, on. <laughs> that's, that's, why, that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> After the break, have you ever wanted the power to decide what your phone does, how it looks, where and what it's made of, and how long you'll keep it? According to our next guest, you will never be able to do that. Not ever. But first, let's take a minute to thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans, the sponsor of this episode. Filling out forms to get a mortgage is frustrating. It's time consuming. How much money do you make? How long have you lived in your current location? How long have you had your job? What are your assets? What are your liabilities? It's daunting and it can make you feel vulnerable to be giving out all that information. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, it's important to work with someone who you can trust, who has your best interest in mind. With Rocket Mortgage, you'll get a transparent online process that gives you the confidence to make an informed decision. You don't have to waste time searching through stacks of paperwork. You can securely share your financial information. You'll get your mortgage approved in minutes. You can even adjust the rate and length of your loan, and you can do that in real time. That way you can make sure to get the mortgage solution that's right for you. So whether you're looking to buy a house or refinance your existing mortgage, you can lift the burden of getting a home loan with Rocket Mortgage. Skip the bank, skip the waiting, and go completely online at quickenloans.com slash TNT. That's quickenloans.com slash TNT. Don't forget to add the TNT so they know that we sent you. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLS consumeraccess.org number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. Tech news moves fast and often the articles we read and talk about on this show are just a few paragraphs, just a snippet of what's really going on with no context. That's why I was excited to snuggle up with my laptop and spend some quality time reading Harrison Weber's venture piece on the rise and fall of the dream of Project Aura, Google's modular phone. Welcome to the show, Harrison. Hey, can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on. Thanks for reading this piece, which is definitely uh, worth reading. You write that Project Aura was a modular phone concept that at one point was supposed to start at $50. It was intended to give you the power to decide what your phone does, how it looks, where and what it's made of, how much it costs, and how long you'll keep it. That sounds fantastic, but your article talks about all the many reasons why this project failed. Let's start with the timelines to get to market. When and how did Project Aura start? 
it started in uh, 2012, uh, in the the summer of 2012, right when ATAP was was um, which is which is Google's kind of innovation, like weird innovation lab when it was started at Motorola. So back in 2012 was like the earliest kind of kernel of the idea, and um, quickly. You know that you know a lot of time passed, and we didn't hear the public didn't hear about it until 2013. Um, and then you know beyond that point, really, it, it was this project that was never supposed to be public. It was a it was a secret project that was this interesting idea about customization back when the maker movement was something that everyone was really excited about. And then uh, because of Dave Hawkins and this this video called Phone Blocks came out, it kind of forced the project into the into the open, which became you know very defining factor of of this product um this thing that uh was supposed to be secret and and, and then ultimately became public too early and, and maybe that was part of its downfall so phone blocks uh, this video was like a viral video about this modular phone concept and hawkins sort of had this idea that this would be maybe a decade worth of work and meanwhile, Google was already, ATAP was already working on this and they really didn't want it to come out and say, have everyone say, look, you guys copied this, this guy in, you know, in his garage that had this idea. So they thought they would launch it. Um, and then, so th that, so really it's, it's not necessarily their fault, but then the, the time, I mean, you talk a lot about how uh, they went faster than a lot of the developers were comfortable with, and it had a difference between going back and forth between Motorola and Google. Um, and at one point, it started, it, it really changed. I mean, at one point it was a $50 phone. That was the idea, get this $50 phone into people's hands. When and why did that change? It, it was um, essentially, it was a, a weird issue where this idea, at least if you look at it, if you step back, it's, it's this kind of brilliant idea of, of building a phone out of high tech kind of Lego blocks almost and just sort of reality set in over time. And so, you know, this thing was going to come out in 2015 uh, and it was going to cost $50. And then, and then they, they realized, you know, that's just not possible. You can't really build a phone for $50. And in this idea of building this mac massive ecosystem around these little, little tiny pieces, it just became too complicated. So slowly and slowly they started kind of making it a simpler and simpler idea until ultimately they made the modularity, the, these little pieces, just sort of like a fun add-on, um, which sort of got rid of the, the power of this of the project. They, they had some of these really crazy, amazing ideas for these modules. Like at first, like they thought about like really big, like the one of the tardigrade is probably one of the coolest ideas ever, you know, where you have this little module where you can have these little tiny creatures in a microscope and you can follow them and there'd be an app with that. Tell us some of the other cool, like what, tell us about these modules. It, it became, you, you know, the earliest idea was, all right, a phone can cost lots of different things. What if you made it so you could upgrade your screen, you could upgrade your battery? What if you only need a really big battery and you don't need a great camera because you just want a phone that lasts? And so at first it was functional and it was about compromises. And then they are like, all right, that's interesting, but only interesting to a small group of people. If we already have this flexibility, like what could we do next? And it evolved into, you know, um, like checking your um, your glucose levels, like a little uh, module that could prick in and measure, you know, like your your blood, uh, the sugars in your blood. There are things in the hidden in the videos. There are lots of little things, like um, like almost like pre kind of paying with your phone credit card modules. Um, there are just so many funny little ideas. The craziest one was putting this microscopic aquarium on your phone, um, which is from this, which was actually came up, uh, Google commissioned uh, this, this agency called Midnight Commercial to come up with the idea. And the, they're the ones who, who came up with it, not Google. But that was the, the, the one of the defining kind of ideas of like, what if we just put this in developers' hands and let them just do anything they wanted? Well, so I, I'm spending a month, I usually use an iPhone exclusively. I'm spending a month using the Google Pixel and I thought I would be really excited about all the choice, but <laughs> it's daunting. And I think that's, that is sort of the story, the real difference between Google and Apple. Um, you know, it's like, there's, there's so much choice. It's like, why, why McDonald's only keeps certain things on their menu? It's too much choice can be exhausting. Do you think that is part of what happened to the Aura project? Ultimately, you know, 
even in this conversation, this phone is kind of hard to explain. I mean, it's a you can you can use metaphors. You can talk about Lego blocks. You can talk about as, as I did. You can talk about never having to throw your phone away. But ultimately, we're talking about a bunch of little pieces of hardware that work together in a seamless way and building out this huge, massive, abstract ecosystem and hoping everything just sort of works. Uh, the problem is, and this is so enticing to developers, this is so enticing to the type of people who would maybe write about Google or would um, you know obsess over Google or work at Google. But the average person, as Apple's proved, is really interested in something that works and, and does what you know, they mostly need in the, you know, throughout the day. And that's the problem with smartphones. You know, there's not a lot of innovation around anything, but making them a little smaller over time. Uh, and that's, that's why this just never, this project could have happened. If, if one timeline didn't slip or if two timelines didn't slip, if they hadn't fussed over, you know, the magnets that made it all connect in the back. Maybe they, if they were just a little ahead on their timeline, it could have just gotten out before it was axed. And if there was enough attention in the, you know, the consumer marketplace, you know, we would have maybe seen this developed for a couple more years by Google since it was already out in the in the public's hands. But I think what they would have found no matter what is that this is just such a complex idea no matter how cool or geeky or fun it is to talk about, it's just so the opposite of the iPhone. And the iPhone has pretty much everything going for it in terms of like what people want. Uh, and, and, you know, that makes me almost a little sad because it would be, it's kind of a boring uh, space right now, the smartphone industry where everything's very iterative, but um, it, it really is. A, a, there are already good products out there that do what people mostly need. And I think that's, kind of would have been its downfall anyways. So Regina Dugan was really a Project Ara's champion from the beginning. Tell us about her role in this whole story. She So there were a bunch of little nuggets in this that I wasn't able to add to this story. So she was almost not hired by uh, Dennis Woodside. And she sort of gave him an, this, this kind of speaks to her character. She gave him sort of an ultimatum when he told her that he wasn't going to hire her. The story that I heard was basically he said, you know, going with this person, this predictable person he was also, he was he was actually planning on hiring was a nice way to, you know, to be safe. Uh, but he but what Dugan said to, to him to him was basically something to the effect of, you know, if you want to succeed, then you need to take a risk. Uh, and she's been this kind of really interesting character at Google for a few years. Uh, she's ex DARPA. So the government agency responsible for doing these crazy kind of projects that pop up every now and then. Um, she's basically kind of hell bent on engineering crazy ideas as quickly as possible and then putting them in people's hands and seeing what happens, which is kind of what good Google stood for for a while. And uh, now she's at Facebook building who knows what, and that's something I'd love to learn more about. Um, but she's been very secretive there, but really she's been the the driving force behind this project and many other projects at Google. And um, with her gone from Google, you're just sort of, Google's starting to look a lot more like sort of a, a, a boring, but, but mature kind of company than it was uh, five years ago. So now she's at Facebook and Project 8 or Building 8 or the, the mysterious, eight, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is, you know, it's it's a lot. It's it's similar to the Moonshots program at Google, which seems to be um, being, you know, torn apart at this point. You know, they keep on dropping things. But I mean, Building Eight, we don't know anything that's going on there, right? Exactly. It's it's um it's very secretive. We know that they have you know, 150 or so employees and and you know millions of dollars being thrown at whatever it is that um, Re Regina's building. But ultimately, this sort of speaks to the state of tech companies today. You know, it may be a little unfair to call Google boring. I mean, I think it's boring now compared to what it, where it was five years ago. But uh, really what we're looking at is, you know, Google's becoming kind of like Microsoft and Facebook is in that space now. And even Facebook's maturing and maybe we'll see a company like Snapchat, you know, go beyond just a few interesting projects and really become this kind of representation of new innovation. Well, I think it's it's hard to talk about this without bringing up 3D printers and the maker movement. You talk all about that. They 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 were doing research into tattoos <laughs> at the beginning yeah. of Project Ara. And I mean, I think 
it, it's good to look at them side by side because there was a moment a year, two years ago where everyone said, you know, there's going to be a 3D printer in everyone's home. Everyone's going to be a maker. And, you know, those movements are still around and they're still very important, but they're never going to be, uh, they're never going to be widespread. They're not going to, most, you know, most people in the United States uh, will probably want to choose an iPhone over a modular phone that you can take things apart. They're, you know, people aren't going to have 3D printers and be printing their own pieces of their cell phones. Do you agree? I, I do. Uh, I think that at least at this stage, in, in the way we, we define these things today, yes. Uh, basically, you know, the way I'd put it is, is there was this exciting moment with 3D printers. There was, ex, you know, exciting moment with, with um, kind of, you know, 3D had a moment. VR is having a moment now. I would love to see VR kind of become this this thing that really takes hold and takes root in the mainstream. But you know, VR could could absolutely be like 3D TVs. It could absolutely be like early AR. It could be like um, 3D printers. I think the big thing is this was an era where hardware sort of reached a moment where things sort of felt, you know, felt kind of they were where they needed to be. And, and and if you look at like the iPhone today, it feels a lot like it felt a couple of years ago. You know, that, that was a revolution, but it really has become this thing of, it's like the laptop. I mean, you know, other than making it a touchscreen, it's not transformative. So I think that everyone was sort of like, we reached this, this peak and there'd been some time since the iPhone blew everyone's minds. And we were looking for this thing that that was the next big thing. And uh, modularity looked like it was going to be this transformative higher hardware movement, just like 3D printing looked like it was gonna upend the way people, you know, the way manufacturing works. And I think now there's just not a lot to cling to. And that's why people are sort of looking at the remaining crazy things like, like VR and AR as the next big step. Uh, because it doesn't look like modularity is going to be the thing, despite how how cool of an idea it is. It is so cool. It makes me so sad talking about because like it was like the un iPhone. Like think about being able to have, you know, if you're a photographer, you can add more, you know, a, a larger camera or more. Like it was it was like the opposite. And <clears throat> it's always sad for me when like innovation seems like everyone's on one stream. And so. Project Era kind of was like that thought of something that was really different that people could, you know, look at things differently and you could end up getting whatever you wanted to that. It seems like you're saying they kind of were too innovative and they they shot too far to that. Um, and, you know, it saddens me to think that that means that we're not going to get any modularity on phones or something that's just really different and really innovative. Uh, one funny thing that came out of reporting on this was that if you look at a lot of devices today, there's a sort of quiet hint of modularity. So even the iPhone, you can buy this battery case. This is a this is a mostly paraphrasing um, one of the founders of Project R on this, just just for to credit him. But if you look at the iPhone, it's this like there's this bumpy kind of battery case you can buy, and that's almost like a module that snaps onto the back. Um, if you look at the Moto Z, they're sort of they're experimenting it in a very, you know, a very gentle way if, compared to what what um, what ATAP and Google really imagined it would be. Uh, but the thing that I think this ultimately speaks to is, you know, right now the only thing that can transform your phone from it being like any other device is software. And software is the only way that developers can make this big change or, 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 or innovate uh, in a way that changes your experience on devices. And ultimately, all of our things, all of the things we do are kind of locked behind glass. And Aura was this idea, in just like 3D printing, of, of, of this physicality of innovation. I just I think that we may see that happen. Um, but the thing about AR and VR is that's also about like digital things. Um, and so it's kind of sad because I think hardware really had a moment. And, you know, some people are saying that things like PCs are getting interesting again, laptops are getting interesting again. The Verge said that uh, recently at CES, but I just don't agree. I, I think that really we're kind of in a long plateau of, of you know, good, reliable, kind of boring hardware. And I, I'd love to see hardware get interesting. Just hasn't, it just, it hasn't really happened in a broad, broad way. Uh, that's too bad. 
Mm. And I mean, the closest the closest thing to my phone becoming a transformer. I'm, yeah. I still have hope. I still have hope. And we haven't even talked about the environmental aspect of this. I mean, we just mm -hmm. think, well, this phone doesn't do what I want. I'm going to have to buy a new one. Whereas that was the promise of Aura as well. Like, you just switch a part out. Um, you know, you've, it's the same thing as fixing things, which we don't do anymore. Yeah, yeah it just, that's true. there's just so much to say about kind of what this could have been. The environmental stuff was a little bit of kind of the earliest element of Dave Hacken's goal, so phone blocks. And even in the earliest stages, that wasn't the, the point of what Google was doing or what Motorola was doing. And so that was always sort of, there's always some dissonance there. Um, but I think it, it goes beyond in, in the environmental side because this is like a device that you would never kind of buy again. You'd buy it once and you'd buy parts and you'd have a phone forever. Um, maybe not forever, but for a long period of time. And so it was, it was upending everything. It was upending like the way hype works around phones. It was, and it just, it, 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 it would have, if it had worked, it would have messed, like it would have shaken the, you know, rattled the whole industry. And, but if it didn't rattle the industry, no one was going to notice. And so it was always, it always had to be this crazy idea. It always had to have all these different elements, um, including, including the environmental side, which I think would have motivated a lot of buyers. Uh, but there's sort of an all or nothing deal. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the way phones are. I mean, that's why phones are so designed to work for everybody instead of it being like, well, what if there's this great microphone because you're a musician or what if you're a photographer? It just has to work for everybody. And I think that's kind of the most practical financially, you know, makes sense, but very boring in terms of, you know, originality or character. Well, thank you, Harrison, so much for joining us. I really, um, I really enjoyed reading this piece. It's, I mean, I think as tech journalists, sometimes we have two switches. It's like modularity is the next big thing. Modularity is dead. And <laughs> your piece really talks about everything that happens in between. Um, and if you're not working on a book, I think you ought to. So that's, <laughs> it was a great read. Harrison Weber is the executive editor at VentureBeat. You can read the story and follow him on Twitter. He's at Harrison Weber. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. We got an email from Joel who writes about our discussion last night about layoffs at Pandora and how they increase shareholder value. Joel says, if Pandora is trying to maximize shareholder value, this might be a good move in the short term. Pandora may be saving money this year. The question is, what are they losing in innovation next year and the year after that? The U.S. auto industry tried this efficiency drive and Japanese auto companies ate them for lunch. Seems like we still haven't learned. So you can write to us at tnt at twit.tv and we will hopefully read your email on the air. You can also call us. After the break, if you remember Zork and rotary phones, then you are old. And you might enjoy this next story. But first, let's take a minute to thank Blue Apron, the sponsor of this episode. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Their mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone while supporting a more sustainable food system, setting the highest standards for ingredients, and building a community of home chefs. Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with fresh, high-quality ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. Each meal comes with a step-by-step, easy-to-follow recipe card and pre-portioned ingredients that can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. Every little ingredient comes in its little package, tiny little bottles of whatever you need. You don't have to buy a giant bottle of something that you're going to use two teaspoons of and then throw away. Save time and money. Shopping at the grocery store is 60% more expensive than Blue Apron. If you spend a lot eating out or at high-end grocery chains, now you can spend under $10 per person. That's for healthy, home-cooked meals. And you can customize your recipes every week based on your dietary preferences and choose a delivery option that fits your need. There's no weekly commitments. If you don't want it week one week, you don't have to have it. You only get deliveries when you want them. Blue Apron delivers to 99% of the continental U.S. Blue Apron sets the highest quality standards for their community of over 100 50 local farms, fisheries, and ranches across the United States. Blue Apron not only supports a more sustainable food system, it supports happy and healthy families because cooking together builds strong family bonds 
and research shows that Blue Apron families cook nearly three times more often. New recipes are created every week by Blue Apron's culinary team, and then those recipes are not repeated within a year. Spicy shrimp and Korean rice cakes with cabbage and garlic piccata with scallion rice and chipotle pepper enchiladas with lime sour cream. Those are just some of the items on the menu. You can check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping. Just go to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of tech news today. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. And finally tonight, we have a project of whimsy from the website The Outline. An engineer named Mitch Patanod figured out how to hack an old rotary phone to play a text adventure game. He bought a $15 phone on eBay and then he used the $9 chip computer. I think we can take a listen to what it, a look and a listen, a listen. With the board in front of there is a small mailbox here. What would you like to do? Go to the mailbox. Go to the small mailbox reveals a leaflet. What would you like to do? Take leaflet. So take apparently you can talk back like and play the uh, text adventure well, game. Uh, did you play a lot of Zork, Georgia, in your childhood? I didn't. I didn't, but this is completely up my alley. I love the idea to it, and I, I did play a lot of other games, but I've never played for Zork, so that would be actually something that I would be interested in doing. And I love the fact that it's on a rotary dial phone. I think that that's really awesome. <laughs> did you ever play text, many text adventure games? Was that part of your childhood? I, I did. I even did, like, the choose-your-own-adventures, like, really mm -hmm. hardcore you know, like, so this is like a good mix between both of them. And I, I don't know, I think it's really cool. Would you be, would you be playing this? Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I did go through a text adventure game uh, when I was working at Tech TV. That was, uh, I covered a lot of that. And I, I like it because it, back then it was really hard to do game graphics and everything. So text adventure that they were uh, easy to do and, and fun to play. So I, th I think I love it when people go back to their nostalgic roots. And I love the chip. We have two of them. I don't know if you've tried this $9 computer or if your kids have played with it. Uh, have you? No. Tell me about it. Uh, well, it's $9. You can do all kinds of different things with it. Like, for example, put put Zork on a rotary phone. Uh, my kids have played around with it. And then we, ha Leo has this, uh, like the chip, I forget what it's called, but it's like the, what is it called? The chip. Pocket? Yeah, the pocket chip. So then that's what that is. Yeah, so you can put the, the chip into the thing and have a keyboard and everything. Otherwise you have to attach an external keyboard, which is fun too. But yeah, you should check oh, this out. That. It's, yeah. Oh yeah, this is great. Well, my kids do bits box. Um, and they do Swift Playgrounds. So I think that this would be really a cool mix. What did your kids think of it? They loved it. I mean, they, you know, just playing around with it because it was hard to figure out what to do with it. But especially before we okay. got the pocket chip when it was just the $9. Um, that's, they, you know, they played a little bit and got frustrated. Then we got the, the thing that you put it in and that's $60. But that's worth it too. They really liked it. Thank you so much for joining us, Georgia. Uh, what are you working on? You have so many podcasts that you are either co-hosting or sitting in on. Uh, what are all the exciting things you're working on right now? So, yeah, there's the I'm More Show and there's also Disruption and, uh, of course, Anxiety Dash Videos. If you're dealing with anxiety or depression or parenting issues or sleep issues, I have that as well. And, uh, yeah, I'm on I'm More every once in a while writing an article. <laughs> And do you have any new products or anything that you're playing with besides your AirPods? Yeah, well, right now I'm I'm actually I'm back on VR because I have the new game uh, Super Hot, and so it's just a great fun game to be able to uh, play with. And so that's what my husband and I are doing that and Paintball Rec Room. <laughs> it's taking up almost all our time. And you have the Vive and the Oculus. Is that we right? do, and we play together. So we've we've cordoned off a room, taken out our couch, bought huge bean bags, and so we drag the beans bags out, put a pillow segregation so that we don't thwack each other and you know knock one of us out, and then we play in the same room together, which is a lot of fun and makes VR a, a communal kind of experience. We just both look ridiculous at the same time. <laughs> so when people come to you uh, for like marriage counseling, do you say like you know do you suggest they play VR together? Well, no, <laughs> no, gaming together can be a frustrating experience. 
it's, it could end well. It could end very poorly. <laughs> so you have to be, be careful with that. Okay, so you're not ready to say that the couple that plays VR together stays together? No, no. I have. We have had a couple of VR fights, and I did hit my father-in-law in the head while he was napping on the beanbag relatively hard. So that, that caused a little bit of an issue as well. So you have to be careful. VR with caution. So you mean physically hit him, not in VR? No, I, I, yeah, I was, I physically hit him. I was, I was trying to run away from someone that was gonna, <laughs> it seemed very real at the time. <laughs> so you hit him in RW, real world. Is that what you call it? I, I did. Yeah. I hit him in the real world and then had to deal with it in the real world. So what, what happens in VR does not always stay in VR. <laughs> okay. Good advice. I was looking for just like one little, you know, piece of uh, advice right. for that. Got it. Got it. All right. <laughs> got it. Well, Georgia, thank you so much. You can find Georgia on Twitter at iMore uh, and at anxiety slash videos dot com. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. <laughs> And Monday's guest will be Owen J.J. Stone, and then Jason will be back on Tuesday. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, midnight UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv or leave us a short voicemail. We are at 260-TNT-SHOW. You can also find us on Twitter. We're at Tech News Today TV. And find all the ways to subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash TNT. I am on Twitter at Megan Maroney. Thanks to our technical director, Anthony. Thanks to Mario for running the teleprompter. Thanks to Kevin for editing the show. And thanks to you for talking tech with us. We'll see you on Monday. Bye.